knows how you come across somebody once in a while you, you shouldn't have messed with. That's me. Well, I'm I am not an African American. You're Oreo cookie, white right in the inside and black on the outside. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. Talking that idiotic stuff you talk about, I will slap you. Go ahead, make my day. Black as the ace of spades, but 100, 100 percent American. Heard around the world by everybody and their mama. The Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show. Uniting the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We also rebuild in the family by rebuilding the man. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with me. I absolutely appreciate it. I have with me for now Rachel Swan. Um she has a brand new book out. She's a New York Times reporter and author of American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestor of Michelle Obama. A very interesting book. We'll tell you how to get that as well. Uh, let's see, Rachel, good morning and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> no, I appreciate you being here. A very interesting book. What what made you decide to write about Michelle Obama? Well, you know, I covered Michelle Obama's first year in the White House as a reporter for the New York Times. And I ended up writing an article um, that was about her ancestry. It was about her great-great-great-grandmother was a slave girl valued at $475 in 1852. And her great 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 grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. Right. And the very next day after the article ran, a publisher contacted me and said, "What about a book?" <laughs> Were you, you surprised by that? I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, you write about Michelle's. Uh, she had her uncle. This woman, I guess, her great great grandmother had a son. Uh, uh, around, I think, 1860s mm-hmm. to, uh, by the name of Dolphus. And he was a biracial boy as well, right? That's right. So Dolphus was the First Lady's great-great-grandfather. And you're absolutely right. He was born into slavery sometime around 1859, 1861. And um, he, he lived a, a pretty remarkable life. You know, somewhere along the way, um, after freedom, he decided he wanted nothing to do with the sharecropping life, and he moved from Georgia, where he was born, to Birmingham, Alabama. Right. And um, by 1900, he owned his own home. By 1910, he owned his own business, and uh, he was a founding member of two churches that still are up and running today. Um, he really uh, carried the family line from the sharecropping uh, world into the working class um, urban environment, um, and so he had he was a success story. But he also lived at a time when, you know, the doors were closing around him and segregation was hardening. Um, around the time that he died in 1950 in Alabama, and the news of his passing appeared on the front page of the black newspaper there. But you know, the bombings had started in Birmingham, so he he's, his life spanned quite an arc. I thought that was interesting when I read that, and that this man Dolphus was able to do so well back then, and you know he, he even though he was free, he wasn't. You know the opportunities were not there as they are today for black people. Uh, why do you think he did better then than the blacks are doing now? You know what? You know it's hard to it's it's a really hard question, a good question, a hard question. And I don't know that I know the answer. I think he was a very driven person. And I think there was something in him that that drove him to really persevere despite enormous, enormous difficulties. He was a really religious man, too. And uh, his faith may have carried him and helped him along the way. He had a rough time of it. He lived during a time of 
of real uh, discrimination. Blacks were losing the vote. Um, By the time he was an adult, uh, when he arrived in Birmingham, blacks could still vote, some of them. By the time, you know, the 1910s, 1920s rolled around, that that was gone. And, um, you know, there was a lot of violence. The Ku Klux Klan um, were on the rise. It was a tough time. He lost several of his children to, to illness. Um, so it was it was a tough time, but he right. still managed to, you know, carve out a life and to carry the family forward. Yeah, it was like that when I was growing up. I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama under the Jim Crow law mm. and laws. And but yeah, black people were thriving. You know, they they sent their kids off to black universities around the country. Uh, they came back as professionals. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had to work the cotton fields and things like that, but we did much better, you know, as far as morality is concerned and family, respect for one another. It was strong while I was growing up, and it's somehow or another it's lost now. Uh, uh, this man also, Dolphus, he, he, he was a well-known deacon, as you write about here down in Montgomery. Um, how was he... Was uh, being biracial, was he affected at all by that? You know, it's it's a, an interesting question. He, The people who knew him said that he looked near white. That's how they described him. <laughs> yeah. But he never, he, he, he embraced, he, his life was a life, uh, African-American life. He lived in, um, uh, well, once as things got increasingly segregated, he lived in a black community. He um, was a deacon in black churches. On the other hand, though, his color may have made things a little easier for him. For a long time, I couldn't understand how his business uh, was allowed to operate in a white, what people described as a white business district. And um, I came to learn that the, um, the zoning codes actually didn't forbid blacks from owning businesses in this district. Right. But um, blacks who had tried previously were often, you know, forced out, uh, threatened, um, and, and forced out, bombed out sometimes. And I, I don't know whether the fact that he was so light, whether, you know, people made a little room for him there. Oh, okay. He talked about, who knew him, talked about, you know, he had white customers. He, was a, he had a carpentry shop. And so I don't know whether or not that that um, helped him at all. But he he uh, he was biracial, but he you know lived life and embraced life as an African American man. And I wanted to speak to something else that you you raised when you talk about um, values. One of the things that's really fascinating when you go back into this history, Michelle Obama's family, and just in our nation's history, was just the value uh, when you talk about marriage. I mean. After slavery ended, you know, people were, you know, and you hear it from these military officers at, at camps where people were running away during the Civil War, people were lining up to get their marriages recognized and legalized. And mm-hmm. Michelle Obama had ancestors in um, Virginia um, who were free for, for decades before the Civil War, but they, like Others lined up at this courthouse in in uh, Henry County, Virginia, to make sure that their marriages were recognized under law. And you know, at a time when something like you know seventy percent of children are born outside of marriage in the African American community, you look back on those times and think, boy, uh, things have really changed. Yeah, uh, you're right about that. And as I was reading your book, I thought of the same thing. One other last point, I think, about Dolphus is that you mentioned some of his children, Dolphus, some of his children died. He he got married, according to your writing, many times. How many times did he marry? He did. <laughs> he got married four times. Amazing. The fourth the fourth was the keeper. She he, he stayed with her for a long time. How many children did he have? Oh, and you know... Uh, that uh, you're catching me there. Oh, okay. I don't remember more uh, about five, somewhere five to seven, and at least let me think about this. Two, at least at least three died, and and some of them died later in life. You know, during the early 1900s, it was not uncommon. You know, people had these large families, and 
and it was not uncommon for children to die right. from illnesses. Yep. Some of his children was more tragic though, because they they survived to be teenagers, and at that at that point, you would have thought they would have been safe. Let me take but, a quick break. We'll pick up on this and tell the folks how to get the book. Eight 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 seven seven five three seven seven three. Back in a moment. Okay, folks, welcome back. Thanks so much for being with me. Very interesting book by Rachel Swans. Um, she is a New York Times reporter and author of American Tapestry, uh, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestor, ancestry of Michelle Obama. And uh, we're going to tell you in a minute how to get the book. Rachel, I want to go back quickly because of time here to the question of uh, Do- Dofus. And that he, it was interesting that he married before having these children. He didn't have them out of wedlock. And you say that he married at least four times and a couple of his wives at least died. And that's why he married so many times? Well, I wish I could say that for sure. (laughs) It looks like um, he and his first wife may have split up um, because he remarried while she was still alive. Um, the second wife, I believe, um, died, and the third wife, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> so but I a, think it, it may have been a complicated picture. But he was a very, very interesting man, uh, and I really appreciate the way he, you know, he lived his life. He was determined, and he did what he wanted to do and needed to do in life, even at a time when a lot of people think it was rough for black people. I want to ask you, and tell us about... Uh, something called Quadroom Droom, and Octo Room? Yeah. You know, he was biracial, and that's the terminology that we use today. But back then, um, you know, the census and the government tried uh, to, you know, label uh, people of color. And they had all kinds of, you know, depending on what they calculated <laughs> the percentage of, of black blood you were, he, Dolphus, appeared as mulatto in the census, uh, and they had quadroons for people and octoroons. Um, and it wasn't until 1930 that they eliminated those categories for, for black people. Were, were, that, were those categories considered negative? You know, I think it depends on who you were asking. I mean, there were some uh, mixed-race communities um, uh, where people put a value on the fact that they were mixed people, that they they actually, and, and the truth is that many of these um, families, uh, mixed-race families, uh, whose ancestors or parents or grandparents were, were white slave owners, sometimes benefited from it. Sometimes a slave owner might might not recognize them formally, but might leave them some land or right. get some education. And so there were people who valued, as you know, we still in the community have some of these issues of color. There were yeah. people who valued that that lighter color. That was a time over at uh, Howard University. You you couldn't even get into that school unless you were light skin. They didn't take dark skin blacks at the time. It's changed now, of course. But you're right. The color of the blacks within the black community was very, very interesting at one point. You write that uh, uh, mulatto, 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 a word of half black, half white, forebears pop up across Mrs. Obama's family tree. Uh, Explain that briefly for us. Sure. You know, like so many African-American families, this this notion that, you know, we're just black, white, Hispanic is, is simply not true. And, you know, Mrs. Obama, like many of us, had, you know, white ancestors, Native American ancestors um, scattered across her family tree. And if you go far back into her family tree, each of her grandparents had ancestors who were described at some point in the in the census as mulatto. So Michelle has, like Obama, she has white blood in her as well then. That's right. She is a descendant, like so many of us, of slaves and slave owners. Yeah, and you write about how she, Michelle, spent vacations 
uh, near the plantation where some of her family members have worked as slaves. But yet Michelle Obama doesn't talk about her uh, being, you know, the mixed race or her family at all. She doesn't seem to be interested in that. Well, you know, I actually I think she didn't grow up. Uh, her family didn't talk about it. Grow when she was growing up, her family didn't talk about it. There was a lot of silence um, in the family about slavery, about mixed ancestry. Her uncle told me that he tried to talk to uh, his elders about what they knew about uh, slavery and what they knew about the different shades of color in the family, and people didn't, simply didn't want to talk about it. Uh, Mrs. Obama, as first lady, though, has tried to, you know bring attention to this period in our history. She's uh, unveiled uh, a bust of uh, Sojourner Truth in the Capitol and uh, more recently won a statue of Harriet Tubman. She has invited children to the White House on Black History Month and talked to them about how that house was, in fact, built in part with slave labor. Um, When the president went to Ghana, they went to visit um, the... um, the prisons where uh, Africans were held before they were taken to the United States. But this is, as an adult, as as a child in her family, there was not discussion. And much of this history was lost, and, and it was new to her um, because there was not discussion across the generations about the history. Yeah, I noticed that Michelle has a much more typical bat, uh, black American background than Obama does. Uh, we're running out of time here. To, uh, quick question, then I want you to tell the folks how to get your book. Is Michelle Obama aware of your book? Did you interview her at all for the book? She is aware of the book, and unfortunately for me, she doesn't do any book interviews. It's our understanding she'll do her own book someday. <laughs> oh, okay. um, but her family members shared their memories and their beautiful photos uh, for the book, and I'm yeah. really grateful for that. Yeah, you do have nice pictures in there. Uh, tell the folks how to get the book American Tapestry. You know, you can get it on um, Amazon.com, so you can order it online. It's in paperback now. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. Call your independent bookstores and ask them for it. Um, it is available, and I think it will tell people a little more about Mrs. Obama's family, but about our American story, and I think that's what's important. I have a good friend who is a professional, and... He, uh, after while reading a book, I was, was reminded of some things that he discovered about his family. He did a family tree, and it was amazing how intertwined they were with white people that were in their own community. They were related to those folks, but they never spoke of, His parents never spoke about it. And so he decided to look it up for himself. And a whole lot of white folks around him, they're like cousins and uncles and everything. He right. did not know about it. Right, right. And I think, you know— we as African Americans owe it to ourselves to to reclaim and unearth our history. Yep. Um, and we can do it more easily now with online tools like Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org. And if we don't collect the stories of the older people in our families right now who are living and might still be able to tell us something, we will lose those stories. And so I hope people will be inspired. Uh, to, to, to talk to the older people in their families. I think after reading American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, I think a lot of people will go out now and find out more about their family history. This book kind of, you know, not kind of, it encourages you to do that. Very interesting book, Rachel Swan, Swain. Swan, thank you for it, and I appreciate you being with me this morning. Oh, it was a pleasure. All right. Have a good day now. Thank you. All right. Okay. Quick break. Back in a moment. 